Hi everyone, welcome to this conversation with Tanishtha Samantha and today we are going to talk about aging, gerontology and sociological research. To briefly introduce our speaker, Tanishtha Samantha is an associate professor with the Department of Social Sciences, Flame University, Pune, India. Her research focuses on the nexus of health and aging in India, examining questions related to intergenerational relationships, placemaking, social capital, older adult sexualities, and theory development in aging. In another line of inquiry, she also examines the sexual and reproductive health of women through the intersecting lens of the body, materialities, and the market. Tanishtha serves on several journal editorial boards, including Anthropology of uh, sorry, Anthropology and Aging, the Sociological Review, and the Journal of Aging Studies. Originally from Kolkata, formerly Calcutta, Tanishtha received her graduate level degrees, master's and PhD from the Department of Sociology, University of Maryland, College Park. She's an accomplished writer and has published widely in journals and popular platforms. Tanishtha, welcome to Doing Sociology and I'm very excited to talk to you today. Thank you so much, Yudhuparna. Yeah. Right. So let me begin by asking you a very basic question about what gerontology actually is and how did you get interested in the field? How is it connected to sociological research? Right. So um, so gerontology, like, you know, I mean, um, of course, it's a very American kind of a coinage. Um, you know, it's, it's, it has different names uh, depending upon where you are. Uh, so it's essentially a study of uh, individuals in their later years. And um, I don't want to immediately call it like, you know, older people, because as you know, that, um, you know, the category of old is also kind of a social construct, which kind of varies uh, from one context to another. So um, older people in India is typically considered, you know, the chronological age 60 and above, but it could be very different if you go to, a, you know, the industrialized or global north, where the category of old, uh, you know, assumes a very different cultural significance. So, um, so this particular body of uh, or the field, I would say, kind of studies and examines, you know, different questions about older uh, lives, in terms of health, well-being, education, uh, economic uh, status, and so on and so forth. So, um, so that's like you know to put it very, uh, I think, in a in a very crude way. But we can of course discuss some of the complexities of the discipline later. But um, so my interest, as you asked. Uh, you know, I mean, I uh, it's essentially, you know, I, I as you know that you know my background is in applied economics, and then I was introduced to American uh, sociology, which is also very quantitative, at least the one that I was introduced to, and it continues to be very positivist, as with many other social science disciplines in the U.S. So, um, so for me, like you know, to make the transition from applied e economics to sociology, I think gerontology uh, was an interesting, I would say intellectual bridge because you know it's a very uh, empirical and an applied discipline so for me um, I would say and I know that this is not particularly inspiring but um, it was more of a I think uh, you know pragmatic decision than a uh, substantive curiosity uh, to kind of move from sociology to gerontology which uh, to, which to me like you know seemed to be a, a good kind of a transition to make uh, given my training and background so so yes that was why I started looking at these questions. Um, right. Uh, so what do you think gerontology would mean in the context of the global south, particularly, you know, in India? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, you know, it's interesting you ask that question, because, uh, like I said, you know, at the outset that, you know, any field and particularly a field that is um, very much um, related to the social category of age, uh, you know, it, it, it has different kind of, I would say, um, intellectual questions um, that are being examined in different contexts. And uh, just as many other social science disciplines, I would say, um, you know, the gerontology, at least in the global south, you know, largely, if I have to kind of talk about that, I would say that, you know, because of the uneven nature of demographic transitions, you know, I mean, I'm sure most of, uh, uh, you know, um, researchers are more or less familiar with, you know, the transitions, the demographic transitions that happen from very high fertility, high mortality regimes to low fertility, low uh, mortality regimes with progress and development and so on and so forth. So um, as you know that, you know, I mean, demographers typically kind of chart these trajectories, right? So countries in the global south, you know, they're demographic transition, I would say, began much later than the developed West. So which 
also means that um, you know countries in the global south um, had their populations uh, entering into their older ages much later than uh, you know countries in the global north. But one of the interesting catch, I would say, in in you know this kind of a demographic history, is that um, while in the global south, you know, people entered their older ages much later than that of uh, 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 the developed uh, north. But you know, the transition was very fast paced, which essentially means that, uh, and which is a very interesting demographic phenomenon, I think, uh, when you look at comparisons between north and south. So, which essentially means that um, you know, countries in the global south also had very less time to kind of adjust to this new demographic reality, so to speak. So, um, so, so I think that kind of tells us, you know, how gerontology is also being perceived. So, in India, particularly, if we come to um, you know, India, um, you know, the provisioning of older persons, as we know, you know, remains quite limited. So, this means that um, you know, older lives are often viewed through the lens of an impending, like a danger. It's almost like apocalyptic uh, in scope. So, and and you would, uh, you know, I, I think um, if you read like, not only just journal, but also um, I think um, more kind of a popular writing, you would see that or media writing for that matter, you would see how this particular cohort is often, um, you know, understood by invoking disaster and war metaphors like silver tsunami, gray wave, population bomb, and so on and so forth. So um, so I think this kind of a moral panic around the numbers of this demographic group um, has shaped the gerontological discourse, um, and I would say, you know, larger public imaginations um, in, in India. And uh, so most of the gerontological scholarship that comes out of India, um, you know, is has relied very heavily on, for example, some of the statistics that are again very, you know, commonly known because they have made into, you know, their way into media and more kind of a popular, um, I would say, consciousness. Uh, so dependency ratios, you know, these kind of uh, alarmist projections, uh, old age poverty rate, uh, you know, rates, uh, disease burdens, and so on and so forth uh, to study this particular group. So I would say that this body um, of work is influential, very influential, and of course, very significant. But um, this datafication, you know, as I call it, of uh, uh, later life has made the practice uh, of gerontology in this country less reflexive, you know. So when you ask that, you know, how do you do gerontology in this country, just as, you know, as doing sociology or or just doing any discipline for that matter, I would say it, it lacks that reflexive kind of a praxis and instead has become a a discipline which is very much you know governed by its instrumental and functional characterizations right so um, so that i would say you know kind of largely uh, talking about the how the discourse has emerged in the global south and also more so in india because india has also amassed a lot of data around um, older persons right so i think i think this this particular problem of datafication um is somewhat more amplified in the in the context of indian gerontological tradition yeah right and it's a more related question i mean what would be some of the key research areas in gerontological education in india right um so you know i mean just as any other uh, social science discipline um uh, you know, gerontological education also kind of, I would say, epitomizes this this particular intellectual lack. Um, so, um, so gerontological education in India, um, you know, is only taught, as you know, and uh, also researched in handful of uh, higher education institutions. So, um, and the research uh, output particularly falls into, I can actually talk about it in few major categories, including medical, biological, psychological, and behavioral um, investigations of aging. So uh, just as many other disciplines, I think uh, gerontology particularly, I would say also has a somewhat biomedical kind of a, a gaze in the sense that, you know, it started um, at clinical uh, locations, so in, in hospitals, in the, you know, in, as, as a geriatric kind of a practice. So I think um, the social component of it um, has suffered, although, you know, it's not to say that the, the social gerontological questions, um, you know, have, have now been examined, but I think they still suffer from that kind of a gaze where um, it becomes almost compulsory to measure, control, and predict. 
So, um, so I think that quantification and that that idea that you know, I mean, gerontological subjects in this case, uh, you know, people older, uh, or, you know, sixty and above, can be understood only through the language of disease, debility, deprivation, um, economic deprivation is is something that you know becomes the standard kind of a normative to do this discipline in this country. So, so while I mean, this is not to say that you know the scholarship that has come from India is not important. I think it it's very important, especially for policy purposes. Um, but it remains very functional in its scope. So, questions of living arrangements, uh, questions of um, health security, economic security, um, social networks, uh, you know, remain remain very prominent uh, kind of areas of research. But education, of course, is a different thing because, uh, like I said, you know, it's been very limited. Uh, you know, there's only a handful of um, programs in India that actually teach uh, gerontology as a, as a, I don't think like, you know, uh, uh, other than diplomas, I don't think India still has gerontology programs as compared to, say, you know, uh, uh, disciplines um, in the global north, Europe or uh, uh, North America for that matter. Yeah. So uh, do you think that inclusion in curriculum and more promotion mm -hmm. of uh, gerontology programs will help? I mean, a related question is also that can we produce a decentered and culturally inspired gerontological tradition? Right. So, um, so I think there are a few things to this particular uh, um, aspect. And you're right that, you know, I mean, the question whether, you know, the curriculum uh, can be uh, decentered, right? So that... Um, so that that's something, of course, uh, you know, comes a little later because, like I said, uh, the subject itself, you know, remains um, very, very limited in scope. And um, one of the, uh, the the one that I have identified, you know, in my um, I would say in my uh, uh, long practice uh, of gerontological, uh, um, you know, uh, the discipline of the last uh, decade or more. Um, I feel that, you know, I mean, and this, of course, you know, is a problem, so to speak, of um, other disciplines as well, is that most of the frameworks and perspectives, you know, remain um, very Eurocentric. And there's also a methodological standardization, right? I mean, um, a kind of an uncritical import, if you will, of assumptions and methods from the Euro-American tradition. So, um, so gerontological education, just as many other, um, I would say, uh, fields, not so much sociology. Sociology and anthropology, I think they have their kind of, they've gone through those kind of a decolonized, uh, you know, praxis, at least in India. I think it's just much more evolved, but I think gerontology is still um, kind of going through, or for some reason, you know, that moment, decolonizing moment has, you know, eluded. Uh, so, um, but it remains uh, quite aloof from um, evolving into a very culturally informed field. Um, so, for example, the critical gerontology, which is similar to critical uh, sociology or anthropological thought, you know, the tradition that emerged from the, the political movement of the Frankfurt School, which privileges the plural construction of being so. So that uh, dimension, for example, um, is something that, you know, is completely missing in, in the way how we have produced gerontological knowledge uh, in this country. So I, you know, to your question that... Um, you know, how do we then make the curriculum much more inclusive, much more decentered, um, much more plural, right? Um, so, I mean, I I was recently reading um, this very interesting article by Amita Bhaviskar, I think, uh, you know, an American anthropologist, and uh, uh, and she was talking about um, how do we radically imagine, uh, you know, the sociology or anthropology teaching in India. And, and one of the things uh, um, I think she notes is that, you know, how would it pedagogical practices where first generation students are invited, for example, to record and write their own um, social context and connections and lived experience with theory. And, and that can, you know, turn the standard, you know, very this, this kind of a methodological, I would say, this very evangelical way of doing, uh, using data or method on its head. And I, I, I would say that, you know, similarly, gerontology education could also engage students from diverse backgrounds through oral histories, through caring practices, through memoirs, diaries in different languages to bring alive this complex, you know, entanglement of age, context, and memory. And I think gerontology is very well poised to do that. Um, so, I mean, I, I would think that this is a missed opportunity if we don't kind of push ourselves to, you know, to make this kind of a um, radical reimaginations, if you will, 
um, of this uh, of the discipline. So, um, so I think uh, you know, I mean, it's it's definitely uh, you know possible to do that. Uh, you know, to kind of um, uh, you know to kind of privilege some of the local epistemes, you know, local understandings. You know, a similar decolonizing process that has you know taken uh, place in several other disciplines uh, in India. I would say it's very much possible, but gerontology has has been pretty, I would say, reticent to kind of uh, you know um, adapt to these changes um, that that, for example, in other parts of uh, the world, which also started gerontology as a very positive discipline, but they have also gone through these kind of, I would say, um, reflexive consciousness of how to think uh, 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 and trouble the discipline. Um, but I think that troubling has not uh, you know, happened yet. But I mean, there's no reason to believe that it won't. Uh, I think uh, I'm quite optimistic that, um, you know, through this kind of, uh, you know, through these kind of dialogues that you're kind of having through writings, I think is definitely um, possible to unsettle and trouble those um, certainties of, um, uh, of the gerontological tradition as we know it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a very good uh, optimistic kind of response as well. Uh, <laughs> we were talking about aging and, you know, mm -hmm. I want to come back and ask you more questions about how aging is sort of understood. Do you think it's a problem in India? I mean, how is it sort of conceptualized? Right. And it's interesting that, you know, you asked uh, whether, whether aging is a problem because, you know, we don't think... Um, you know, um, uh, adolescence or or any other uh, life stage category as a problem, but you know the the word problem challenge is often associated with this particular cohort, and um, that's largely I mean going back to my previous response, I think it's because how um, historically I would say the discipline evolved through the the moral panic right of this demographic uh, uh, you know cohort almost um you know uh, um almost bursting into oblivion right so i think um so i think gerontology also kind of becomes somewhat crushed under this behemoth uh you know burden of this of this numbers and while there's no denying that you know the numbers matter because like for example india has uh, in absolute numbers uh, the second most populous, uh, you know, uh, or the second mo largest population of older people in the world after China, but it's only 9% of the total population in India, right? So because India is still, demographically speaking, a young country, right? So so although we are, you know, older 60 plus population is only 9 to 9.5% of the total population, but in terms of absolute numbers, it's, it's, it's very high. And... Uh, you know, demographers project that uh, by mid-century, which is 2050, you know, the population in terms of absolute numbers would be around uh, uh, 325 million, right, of older persons, which, you know, I mean, just to give you an idea, uh, three, 330 is the, the current population of the United States. So, uh, so you can imagine we will have, um, you know, in terms of absolute numbers, uh, people above the age of 60, similar to the entire population of the United States by 2050. So just to give you the kind of a scale that we're talking about. But, um, and I think this these numbers like, you know, are, um, they really reign supreme, you know, when we are thinking about gerontology as a discipline, when we're thinking about, you know, older people's lives, I think uh, um, these, I mean, Lawrence Cohen, you know, he was writing of course in much earlier, you know, in the eighties and seventies, you know, uh, his anthropological classic, uh, No Aging in India. Uh, talks about this, um, how aging uh, is understood as, as a problem, uh, particularly because um, we don't see this older cohort as a cohort that is agentic. Um, so, so it's almost, you know, their, their, I would say their social position is always, al almost always in a relational form. So we understand them um, in families, in households, uh, and hence, you know, with with this kind of an understanding that um, increasingly we have disintegration of uh, joint families, um, you know, what is the future of older people, right? So uh, where, you know, which family, because family has been the, the kind of a more traditional site for um, care and other forms of instrumental support. So when that is kind of, you know, under threat, uh, you know, family as an institution, you know, how do we care for older people? But what this narrative does is that it not only constructs, I think, aging as a problem, which is what you, I think you rightly pointed out, 
and you will see the media also you know talking about aging as a problem and and different dimensions of this this kind of a moral panic you know manifesting in different ways um but i think what we do when we talk about this narrative is that we take away the the kind of a moral agency of this entire cohort right so so while there is no denying that there is poverty while there is no denying that there is economic precarity associated with this cohort but those are also associated with other uh, age cohorts as well uh, so so i think um, this kind of an institutionalized ageism you know which has kind of um, dominated public consciousness and also i would say intellectual uh, um, you know consciousness is something that um, one needs to address and which is something that I've been writing about. Um, you know, I think my work, um, we can talk about it later as well, is primarily kind of, um, you know, addressing this, um, this very biased kind of an understanding, this very singular kind of a linear narrative through which we understand older lives, right? So, so, so that's, and it's a long response but I hope you know I've addressed why it is understood as a problem and what are the you know different manifestations of that. Yeah. No, I would actually want you to talk about the significance of your research and what your research does. I think some of the issues that you have spoken about. Right. So, um, so you know, my earlier work. So, like I said, you know, I've been almost um, you know, I mean, working in this field for more than a decade now and i would say uh, my earlier work was um, primarily because i came from the background of applied economics and demography i was looking at these questions um, in ways that most demographers or most gerontologists do in the american euro american tradition where you know you have large data sets where you look at associations and causal pathways between um, you know certain social questions right so my doctoral work for example was um, looking at the association between living arrangement, so where older people live, in which kind of family setting, whether they live with their partners or whether they live in, you know, co-resident uh, uh, intergenerational household and how that affects their health outcomes, right? So, uh, and with the assumption that, you know, um, larger families or multi-generational families offer some protective effects uh, to the health of older people as we know it in most Asian societies. So that was the premise. And I find that yes, they do. So I used uh, um, you know cross-sectional survey. It's a huge, uh, like a representative large uh, sample survey. It's called the India Human Development Survey, which is now of course has been used uh, extensively, um, not only to examine questions around older people, but also for other cohorts as well. Um, so I, I, I use that data, and I have used several other uh, you know large representative uh, survey data sets to examine similar questions. For example, questions of social networks. Um, questions of um, you know well-being and health uh, and so on and so forth, right? So, but um, I gradually realized, and I think that's where kind of you know I, mean, I, I took a kind of a detour in terms of the the kind of research that I'm doing in 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 the latter half of the last decade is essentially kind of you know moving away from some of these very positivist you know questions. But not to say that these questions are unimportant, or they're definitely, they remain very important. But how do we kind of, you know, uh, um, reimagine this field, right? And not just, you know, make this field a kind of a, you know, a kind of a mirror um, of the Eurocentric tradition, right? Which is also asking very similar questions as, uh, um, as most scholars in the global North have asked. So, so how do we kind of, you know, depart from these more standard uh, methodological kind of questions. And uh, that's where I think um, I have started uh, looking at this other kind of um, work, which, uh, uh, you know, I don't know whether it's more sociological, but definitely is much more provocative, I can say, in the sense, you know, how can we um, look at alternative models of, um, of living, right? And in the sense that, for example, um, can't we, not understand older lives in 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 the language of agency, uh, and and while trying to do that, you know, I have looked at, for example, uh, um, questions of um, leisure, questions of personal agency, questions of um, later life friendships, which are much more generative uh, to push the discipline um, to this kind of an alternative uh, to you know debility, dependence, and uh, the kind of a social pathology, uh, which gerontology has been often understood. 
So, um, and in that quest, I think I have also kind of, you know, and it has given me, I would say, it has allowed me to also kind of question some of these very Eurocentric traditions, because with the kind of a quantitative methodologies, with the quantitative empirical questioning, I was unable to kind of challenge because ultimately I'm relying on those um, kind of methods and frameworks. So when I adopted this kind of an alternative way of asking questions, I think it also empowered me to, to kind of challenge some of the, um, the certainties, you know, of methods, of perspectives, of frameworks, of pedagogy. So, um, so I think that's where my, I would say, my more recent kind of work, uh, you know, looks, uh, looks at, you know, I'm currently looking at um, uh, actually post-menopausal women and um, as part of the work that I'm actually doing um, as part of this visit, as you know, um, I'm looking at also comparative uh, work of, uh, of Germany and India uh, on late motherhood, how, um, you know, motherhood as a social practice and performance, um, uh, you know, um, uh, changes when, um, you know, under the under the intersection or, or with the intersection of uh, reproductive technologies. So, um, so, so that's something I'm also uh, currently looking at. And, and it's interesting because, you know, I mean, I said, you know, the, the way I have kind of, I would say, uh, changed the gaze of uh, gerontological uh, scholarship um, is also by privileging the idea of agency. And uh, in this new research, you know, I'm also trying to see that while technology, um, you know, seems to be pretty agentic because, you know, you can kind of take your life course decisions at different points, you know, you're not uh, kind of governed by the biological clock anymore. So it's, there is a possibility to upend the life course, the reproductive life course, you know, one can have child in their 40s, in their 50s uh, through IVF technologies and, and other, other forms of reproductive, uh, uh, um, you know, technologies. But um, so it, at one level, it is agentic, but at another level, it also kind of um, disciplines women's lives in a certain way. So, you know, so what are these paradoxes of agency and discipline, right? Uh, um, you know, at the nexus of uh, body and technology. So um, so these are some of the questions I am, I'm asking, and I'm also looking at uh, these questions in different contexts. Uh, uh, Germany, which is an interesting context, because despite being a developed country, it's also very pro-natalist. So how do pro-natalism look like in a context which is um, so economically prosperous, right? So how do motherhood or the performance of uh, motherhood uh, play out in a context which is, uh, you know, where um, uh, uh, the economic, uh, I would say, uh, the economic, uh, you know, empowerment of women has been um, ha has been achieved, right? So, uh, so these are some of the questions that I am kind of, I think, I, is somewhat animating my um, current uh, research in gerontology. Right, and uh, of course, it's connected to your research itself. It's mm -hmm. more about the methods and the approach. And mm -hmm. in the bio, also, I said that you know you use statistical tools, and in your introduction, also, you said you had an applied economics background. So. Uh, why do you use statistical methods? How do you use it? If you could talk a little bit about it, because not many sociologists in India, you know, do that. Right. Um, although I have to say that I'm gradually moving away from that, but I can definitely, I mean, this is something that I do uh, as well, because as we all know that, um, you know, most of the social science disciplines are increasingly becoming very quantitative. Like most of the top journals, uh, you know, whether it's uh, sociology, whether it's, uh, um, you know, geography, or uh, political science, I think all the top journals are also very quantitative, which is a strange kind of a neoliberal turn that uh, I think most disciplines have taken. So it it um, it works in my favor that I have this training. And um, so some of the questions that I have typically asked, and I think um, those become interesting topics for uh, quantitative analysis is essentially um, when you are trying to look at associations, right? Or you're trying to see, um, whether a particular uh, um, event or a phenomenon is affected by uh, the question of age. So, so, for example, like I said, you know, my, my doctoral work was looking at how living arrangements affect health outcomes. I've also uh, looked at how social networks, um, you know, um, how many friends, how, uh, you know, the, the magnitude um, or, or the strength of the relationships, right? Uh, Non-kin friendships affect uh, well-being um, among uh, older 
people and by well-being i mean um, health outcomes essentially subjective well-being so um, so there are <clears throat> there are now a lot of uh, i think data sets that are available so um, india i think the, the one of the um, i would say biggest challenge in doing quantitative research in this country is that uh, most of the data is cross sectional which means that you know they have been collected at one point in time but we are um, you know we are recently going to have panel data like longitudinal data on the older cohort it's called the longitudinal aging survey of india the lassi which actually will allow very interesting analysis uh, that can model time as well, right? So the, the question of temporality, which is an important question uh, uh, for qualitative research can also be modeled uh, through um, quantitative data and statistical models. So I think which of course is a, is very promising and of course very, very seductive, especially when it comes to uh, you know, policy making, right? Um, but um, projections of course, uh, you know, has always been around. And, uh, uh, you know, India, just like many other countries um, have done, uh, you know, statistical uh, projections to understand because they are also important uh, to understand uh, the social and economic provisioning um, and, and, and kind of uh, um, making decisions for the future. So I think it has, you know, the, the field itself has been um, very much benefited from the data that has been uh, you know, gathered over uh, over uh, the last decade or so. And I would say that you know, India has one of the very good data infrastructure and, and architecture, so to speak, in terms of um, examining or doing these statistical analysis. So um, you know, it's very robust, uh, um, I think, data architecture, especially when we look at the uh, representative you know, sample surveys, be it uh, the National Family Health Survey, which is more of a health uh, uh, data, but um, or the uh, the national sample survey, which also has modules, uh, specific modules uh, for older uh, people. We increasingly are also incorporating uh, innovative kind of modules. For example, time use. One of my doctoral students is currently using that. So uh, you know, time use, how you use your everyday time, right? Because time is also um, a very gendered construct. You know, I mean, the excess of it or the lack of it. So um, so it becomes an interesting sociological question that who has more time and who has time poverty, right? So um, especially within an, an, an kind of a household setting. So um, so I think time use data also holds a lot of promise in terms of uh, new research that can come up, um, uh, you know, using statistical modeling and, and, and other quantitative exercises around, um, I think, uh, um, you know, older people. Yeah. Right. Uh, so Last question, uh, because we are also talking about doing sociology. Do you think right. gerontology can also be perceived as a model for doing public sociology? And what would be your take on that? Right, it's a very interesting question. Um, is also something that you know, I mean, I deeply care about. So, um, so yes, I mean, to answer your question, um, absolutely. You know, gerontology. Uh, can be very much conceived as a as a kind of a public project, and in fact, um, I would say gerontology is uh, very well poised, uh, you know, at a very productive uh, juncture where um, it utilizes you know perspectives and frameworks, but its empirical questions uh, directly concern lives of older individuals. So I think uh, it already has an applied dimension. So. Hence, uh, making the discipline more sociable is, is fairly promising, uh, in my opinion. So, for example, um, one of the ways, and, and you know, you're something who are so also, I think, making sociology more sociable. So um, I think this is something that, um, you know, you would agree is that, for example, podcasting, right, which is something that we're doing right now, or popular science writing, uh, writing for the publics, um, I think are fruitful ways to which um, we can reclaim the very applied dimension of gerontology and make it more public. But this would also mean that, and this is not, not just, I would say, specific to gerontology as a discipline, but more so other disciplines, uh, social science disciplines as well, because I think this is a this is something that we need to have more dialogue about other disciplines, right? I mean, how do we make anthropology sociable? How do we make history more sociable? So, um, so I think, but this would mean that the discipline, just like any other social science discipline, needs to be imagined as something that can be, uh, you know, decoupled from production of academic outputs, because that's also something that really govern our um, academic practice, right? I mean, it's, it's you know, I mean, if you produce something for the public, as opposed to producing something for academic output, I think we, we kind of, you know, uh, treat them very different, differently. But I think that 
kind of a hierarchy in terms of uh, knowledge sharing needs to also be challenged, right? I mean, so, I mean, if we conceive, uh, you know, this way, I think gerontological, you know, podcasting, if there was something like that, can animate and intervene in the process of uh, knowledge production, just as uh, um, you know, sociology, I think, has more successfully done. Not only doing sociology, there are many other, you know, I mean, blogs and podcasts, I think, that are very, um, I think, effectively uh, making sociology much more accessible, right? And I particularly like, I mean, I have been also writing about it, actually. So, um, you know, Bourdieu, um, you know, talks about writing uh, uh, for the public and, and actually he talks about what he calls participant objectification, right? Uh, which essentially means uh, um, questioning our own unconscious biases or prejud uh, prejudices. And I think podcasting or writing for the public means, um, you know, kind of is akin to his idea of uh, participant objectivation, right? Where we are kind of putting our intellectual work, which would ideally go into a journal, but now we are putting our intellectual work also under the scrutiny of public about people that we actually research and write about, right? So how do our, uh, you know, how do our academic practice, you know, where, do they hold up when they're under the scrutiny of um, public knowledge sharing? I think it's also something that we have to kind of, you know, I mean, reflexively think about. And ultimately, I think, uh, um, you know, I mean, if we think of making any discipline public, be it gerontology, sociology, or any other disciplines, I think we are also allowing the field to be um, cultivated and communicated outside the more kind of an obscure work that social scientists uh, do, and you know when they submit something to peer-reviewed journals, and and I think it 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 we I mean I, one of the things that and I think you are as doing sociologists are already doing it, but I think it can uh, um, you know there are also several ways how we can make these spaces you know these lively spaces much more democratic by um, not only just talking to experts, right? And I, and I also imagine, you know, doing this for gerontology as a discipline is that not only just experts and, and uh, um, stakeholders, but, but also, you know, uh, kind of connecting and communicating uh, uh, with the participants, the interlocutors, the study subjects, right? Who's, you know, we become almost their mouthpiece, right? So how, you know, what happens when, you know, they engage, you know, and, and how does that dialogic kind of uh, um, enterprise, you know, look like? And, and I think it's just making the discipline much more audible, much more transparent and much more, of course, digestible. So, um, so yes, I mean, I think, uh, uh, you know, there has been a recent uh, kind of, an, I would say, an um, uh, uh, upsurge in terms of imagining different disciplines. Uh, and this kind of an upsurge is good because it goes hand in hand with the plea to decolonize and decenter uh, as well. So I think making it public, uh, just as many other disciplines are attempting to do, I think, um, you know, as, as uh, Michelle Benson, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with her work. Uh, uh, she's also a very strong advocate and kind of draws from uh, Michael Borrowe's work on making um, uh, knowledge sharing much more public. I think she she kind of talks about how uh, social science disciplines, and she's of course talking in the context of sociology, but it can be very well applied to gerontology as well, how it can be an enduring practice, which is collaborative, which is responsible, which is engaged and, and you know, agile and also very creative. So, so I imagine uh, gerontology, which is able to do that. And I, I perfectly think that gerontology is, is very much, uh, um, you know, a very good candidate to do all of these. Yeah. Right. I think, uh, you know, I hope that uh, that kind of public uh, emergence of gerontology also happens. And uh, definitely there's a link between how we look at gerontology and sociology as well. Uh, I'm hoping that our conversation today reaches out to a lot of students who would be interested in exploring something which is relatively uh, new and also exciting. And they can, of course, read your works as well as other people who have worked on it. So thank you so much for uh, talking to us today day and you know uh, we hope that it was as enjoyable as it was for you as it was for me thank you so much Ritaparna for having me